All right, we're starting today The Journey of Little Charlie uh, by Christopher Paul Curtis. Twenty chapters dedicated with love and respect to the Kurtai. I think that means the multiple Curtises. Aban, Ayan, Ebyan, and Liban. Epigraph. A journey is called that because you cannot know what you will discover on the journey, what you will do, what you will find, or uh, what you find will do to you. It's by James Baldwin, a very famous author from the 1900s. So we are just outside of Possum Moan, South Carolina, August 1858. So this is before the Civil War started, so slavery was still happening then. And back then, <clears throat> there was what was called the Fugitive Slave Act that our government passed that allowed <clears throat> people from the South to come to the Northern states to, uh, to capture people who had escaped from slavery. And so even if you made it all the way to Michigan, if you escaped from slavery and made it all the way to Michigan, uh, people from the South could come back and, and claim U.S. property and take you back down. The chapter one, the best critter God made. I'd seen plenty of animals by the time I was old enough to start talking, but only one kind worked me up so much that it pulled the, pulled the first real world I said, word I said out of my mouth. And according to the only folks who was there to witness the whole fuss, the word kept tumbling out of me o'er and o'er for more than half a day. Long enough for Ma and Pa to wonder if I'd bang my head on something and got touched. Long enough for him to start looking around for something to tie across my mouth to hesh me up. Don't know what it was about this critter that riled me so, because when you get holed up next to the other animals, there ain't that much as the spectacular about it. It ain't nowhere near as big as a bar. That means bear. And can't knock the biggest, strongest man down with one swipe. It ain't nowhere near as sly nor quick as a cat. It ain't no good at all at mousing nor catching a hold of birds without a lot of hell. And it ain't got nothing as bad as a reputation as a snake. It don't get nowhere near the amount of talking about in the Bible that snakes do. I'd seen to all them critters and plenty more, but it wasn't until Pap said the puppy that growed up to be Pinky next to me in the dirt in the front yard, and I said, Dog! I guess I done more than just say it. It's told that I screamed, Dog, 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 dog. Pap tells me, Little Charlie, neither you nor the pup hadn't showed signs of being nothing but dour and gloomish, but when we put, put you one next to the other, well, sir, it was though someone struck a flint on gunpowder. Sparks flew. Y'all made, both made noises that neither pup nor babe had ever made, made a four. And while rolling and laughing in the dust, and then, like y'all had to talk about it, and took a vote or tore, tore off in them woods together. Which was shocking, Mom, Pop, Pop, Mom, Pap said, since I hadn't even started crawling proper. Ma tells me, we was worried sick about you, Charlie. Why, if I had a penny for each person would ask me if you was a dimwit, I'd be as rich as George Washington. I don't know how many times I had to tell folks you was just a babe and not five or six years old. That was only why you wasn't talking or walking. I figure the real reason I, I, re, I figure the real reason was I hadn't seen nothing worth talking about till I seen Pinky, and nothing worth getting up and chasing after till that particular minute either. Ma said the way I chased after the puppy brung to mind this contraption she'd seen at a fair in the city of Charleston when she was a girl. Automaton, she called it. It was one half fancy pocket watch, one half tin cane, and one half little boy, and it moved just as stiff and wobbly as you done running after that puppy, Charlie. I don't remember doing the talking, but the picture of that wiggling, squirming, wet tongue, fat ball of fussing and fur is in my head so strong that it's something I'm going to be pondering about the rest of my days. And I'm a real big ponderer. <clears throat> when Ma's working in the fields and the time's dragging, I learned to make myself think on things so as I won't get dim with it. I see what's happened to Ma, how she keep on chopping or digging or weeding without doing no thinking. I seen how if you keep working without doing no thinking in the field, it come a bad habit, 
and you can't help but do it elsewhere too. We look at it different. She says the best way to get through the working in the fields is to make her head be still and quiet as a pond. I want mine to be a river crashing through a waterfall. I gotta be thinking about something or else my head'll pop. That's how I figured out why dogs has worked their way so far neath my skin. Now that I'm older and had lots of chances to see and be around other critters, I think it come down to the eyes. At that first meeting up with Pinky, one them, uh, uh, them one, and then one of us couldn't talk, but we traded looks and both seen something and one another. And when I looked at that puppy's eyes, I seen myself looking back. Sure as if her eyes were mirrors or a couple of shined up silver cups, not just a flexion of me, but something that said, this here critter knows you. And I knowed when she was looking in my eyes that she seen the same exact thing. It didn't take about a half second, but that's, that looks got what got us both to cavort and carrying on so. And that's a look that no animal other than a dog has ever given me since. No other animal, and not very many people neither. Stanky, whose ma was Pinky, had give birth to a litter of six pups, and they all lived. After they were exactly 49 days old, Pap said me and him had to look them over, see if there was a hunting dog in the bunch. Pap told me, Good dog is the same as a good person. They's born that way, not made. Ain't no silk purse that's ever been made out of sow's out of a sow's ear. The pups was squirming and sliding over one another, carrying on something fierce, nipping at anything to move, not caring if they was biting their brother or sister or even their own selves, just looking to get any kind of puppy meat that they could could in the, that they could in them sharp pinnish teeth. All their antics was first-rate nonsense to me. I'd ask Pat, but how can you tell if there's going to be any good hunting when they's acting so coltish and foolish, Pat? There's a couple ways we do it. Pat brung one of the wood crates out the shed and set it on the forest floor behind the cabin. Then we brung the pups out and put them inside the crate. They were still so small that they had plenty of room to move about. Pat said, I'm thinking that it's the black one with the white spot on her tail. We'll see how good my eye is. I couldn't let Pap know, but that one's name was Ashes. When the pups had been first born, Pap got vexed with me once I started naming them. I couldn't understand why, but he'd made me stop. I named him anyway and kept it to, my, to myself. Keep a sharp eye on him and tell me what you see. Pap had gone to the shed and brought out four of his bullets and a pistol. He kept them hid under the floorboards, wrapped up in a fancy piece of thick purple curtain that had beautiful gold tassels sewed on alongside the fringe. The curtain was well known throughout all of South Carolina. It was so fancy because Ma had bought it off in a woman who was a cousin of George Washington. The woman told Ma that George gave a whole set of them to his wife Martha for her birthday, and Martha got vexed, saying George had gone cheap on her paying only $500 instead of the $5,000 she was accustomed to having spent on her. She couldn't buy it having nothing so common in her home and sold the curtains to George's cousins for next to nothing. Ma had told me that meeting with the woman was a sign that the luck of the Bobos was changing. She said in, her, in life there was good luck followed by no luck, followed by bad luck, followed by tragical luck, followed by the luck of the Bobos. That's their family last name. Pap reached in the crate and pulled out the first of the pups, Ashes. He flipped her on her back and held her down by her belly. She squirmed for a second, then sat still. Pap kept her pinned down. After a bit, she began tussling to get free, even biting pot at Pap's hand. Pap shook his head and smiled. He'd done the same with each of the rest of the pups. Some of them fought like badgers to get up soon as they was flipped. Some of them just laid there waiting to see what was going to happen. Curly and Nippy done the same as Ashes. Pat put them all back in the crate and unwrapped the pistol out of the curtain. He loaded it up with four bullets and raised it over his head. I covered my ears. Pat pulled the trigger and the forest shook from the boom. Me and all of the six of them pups flinched. Pat waited a second, then fired the next three bullets fast ass. Sagebrush, Old Thunder, and Squalane kept on flinching with each shot to come, then pressed themselves into the corners of the crate, whining and spinning in circles. Ashes, Curly, and Nippy was different. 
They come to attention after that first flinch and was staring up at the gun with their front legs stiff as stone and their chests all bowed out and their eyes burning. Their ears was perked up and instead of being scared by the noise, they was looking for more of it. These was the same three that stayed till at first when Pat flipped them, stayed still at first when Pat flipped them, but soon tired of the whole thing and fought. Ashes is even making a huffing sound as though she wanted to bark out but wasn't sure if she should. I said to come fit comfort in the scared puppies. I didn't want Pap to know I'd disobeyed his order, so instead of using their proper names, I didn't say nothing more than, It's all right, little pup. There, there, girl. Pap laughed and shouted, Man alive, that old dog done birthed three hunters. Come on, boy, don't tell your mom. But once they's grown and I get some trains, she's going to be getting a store-bought dress. And you's going to be getting some proper shoes. Three hunters out of one litter. We'll keep one of them, and you get to decide which. I didn't let another second get by. I said, we'll keep the one with the white tip tail. Pap didn't, Pap didn't suspect nothing. I said, and I'm going to call her Ashes, which only made sense since that was already her name. Pop roughed up Stanky's neck and said, what a dog. Next day, when me and Ma come out the field toward dusk, I was washing off at the pump. Soon she seen me, Stanky starts up doing something she ain't never done afore. She gets to whining and rubbing herself against my legs, acting caddish. I pushed her off twice, then the third time I was fixing to give her a good swat, but I seen how upset she was, so I held up. What come to mind was that one of the pups must have got sick or maybe even died. Without drying off or nothing, I went round back of the shed to see if that's what got Stanky so jumpy. I looked down in the crate where she kept him and couldn't believe my eyes. Only Ashes, Nippy, and Curly jumped up to give me greetings. Sagebrush, Old Thunder, and Squalane wasn't nowhere to be seen. I looked toward the woods and whistled for him, but nobody answered. Where are they at, Stanky? She kept looking at me all pitiful, whining and sniffing at the crate. I told Mom. She cut her eyes and said, they probably done run off, Charlie. Or maybe they were sick and Stanky took him out to the forest to let nature have her way. I don't know, son. There's other things to fret about. Let me scare up something for you to eat. And even though I had my suspicions about what really happened to them three pups that had flinched it with every shot, first thing after I woke up for two weeks straight, before I went off to the fields, I'd stand behind the cabin and try whistling them up and calling them home. I guess it mean, ain't no doubt I'm a bobo. I didn't have no luck at all. And that's where we'll stop today.